Um, thank you for joining us. Um, it's being recorded. Um, yeah, so today we have uh, Michael Knapp uh, from Technical University of Munich with us. Um, it's a really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have him. Um, so Michael did his uh, PhD from uh, the University of Graz in Austria uh, in 2012. And uh, after that, he was a postdoc with Eugene Demler at Harvard, uh, where he worked on a number of different things, uh, including um, this is where I also met him as I was a grad student then. And we worked on uh, some very nice things in many body localization. But Michael has also contributed a lot to, you know, Bose Hubbard models, Fermi Hubbard models. Uh, he's contributed to um, this generally the field of non equilibrium dynamics. Um, and, uh, and so after his postdoc um, at uh, Harvard uh, in 2015, I believe, he moved to um, TU Munich where he started an assistant professorship. Um, and as I understand, uh, something of a rarity, it was a, it's a tenure track position, which is not something very common in German, uh, Germany, but uh, um, yeah. Okay, so anyway, it's, it's very good to have Michael with us. Uh, he's gonna tell us something about um, getting 2D Fermi Herbert model, I guess, in ultra cold atoms. So let's welcome uh, Michael, it's over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Katik, for the very warm welcome. It's really a great pleasure to give this seminar here today. Uh, as you already mentioned, I mean, I would like to two-dimensional Fermi Hubbard model in ultra-cold atom settings. And I'd like to uh, advocate uh, today how one can yeah, have a different viewpoint on Hubbard physics using these kind of uh, uh, techniques. So the work here has been mainly done by my PhD student Annabelle Borg and also by a master student Wilhelm uh, and we got a strong theoretical support by Fabian who was back then a postdoc in my group also and Frank and, and Eugene. And there's also some experimental collaboration with Markus Greiner's group um, at Harvard. So you know uh, this would be for instance a typical solid uh, which we are studying in, in condensed matter physics uh, here's another one, maybe a, someone who is uh, more famous than the one on the, on the left-hand side. And you know what Harry Potter can do with this Philosopher's Stone is that it can elevate. But the same thing physicists can do with a superconductor. And I think as astonished as Harry Potter is on the right-hand side of the, of the figure here, when he's seeing his Philosopher's Stone fly, physicists are when they are looking at the superconductor, which is elevated above a magnet, right? This is because of the Meissner effect and because of vortex lines uh, trapped here in this type two high temperature superconductor. But they also have some other properties, which is that they allow for a lossless power transmission, which is also used as a technological application in, in, in some cities in Germany, for instance. In Essen, there's a one kilometer long power cable, which is superconducting. And in Munich, they are planning a 12 kilometer long uh, uh, superconduct, high temperature superconducting uh, um, uh, uh, power cable, which should replace or at least uh, yeah, complement some of Munich's power grid backbone. It's kind of interesting because there are 20 million kilowatt hours lost in power just by dissipation through this backbone. So, I mean, at least these are some numbers which can be compensated by, uh, by superconducting cables. Uh, so it motivates us to, uh, to think about that. Yeah, so of course, high temperature superconductors have been discovered about 35 years ago. So there is a long standing history and many, ma many people contributed in measuring the or determining the phase diagrams of cuprate materials, for instance. And we do know that it is indeed very complex. Uh, and the challenge from a theoretical perspective, I think I mean, it's fair to say, that uh, to find a unifying um, a theoretical description is really a big challenge uh, uh, of this field. So I like this phase diagram here, which uh, uh, Bruce and Dalife uh, have been putting in their review, uh, recent review a couple of uh, years back, because actually it does not emphasize so much on the superconducting dome, which is just here beneath this dashed uh, line. It's also not emphasizing so much uh, this conventional antiferromagnet, you know, the antiferromagnet is just, um, has a long range order of a staggered magnetization. 
uh, this is kind of this, this phase here. And maybe before I dive in all the details of the phase diagram, let me also explain to you a little bit the axis uh, here. So on the y-axis, we show temperature. So this would be hot temperature, low temperatures. And here um, on the x-axis, hole doping is shown. So zero hole doping means that we are at half filling. So half filling means that we have on average one electron uh, per site in our system. And we can think about these cuprate materials in such a way that they are layered structures of two-dimensional square lattices. Like this. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, just for general information. And somehow in cuprates, when you look at it for the first time, you may wonder why phase diagrams are plotted like this, but typically hole doping is plotted to the right. So charge carrier density is reduced as we go to the right uh, in this phase diagram, okay? Good, so the conventional phases would be antiferromagnets, superconductivity, and maybe some density waves or stripes, but then there's a lot of uh, other things going on, which is very, uh, very, very exotic physics is uh, kind of occurring. Well, oh, wrong direction. Well, on the one hand, um, there are at very large hole doping, there are these Fermi liquids, which are dilute, but strongly interacting electrons, and they possess, for instance, a resistivity, which is scaling with the square of the temperature. On the other hand, when we reduce hole doping, then we enter this regime of the strange metal, and there one observes anomalous transport properties where the resistivity is proportional to the temperature. So there's one power less temperature compared to the Fermi liquid. And recently, um, this kind of behavior, this anomalous behavior and the resistivity has also been uncovered in experiments with ultracold uh, atoms. So this is the Princeton group by Vasim Bakker in this paper from 2019. They could measure uh, in the Fermi Hubbard model with uh, finite hole doping, the uh, temperature dependence of the resistivity and they saw that it is indeed linearly increasing. So there should be this strange metal phase uh, in, in uh, or is observed, let's say, in these um, quantum gas microscopes too. Big question here is of course, what is the nature of the ca charge carriers? What are roles of, of other uh, co uh, uh, constituents uh, of, of, the, of the system, and so on and so forth? So actually, Michael, yes. in, in some sense, the, the strange metal phase is probably the easiest for them to realize in ultra cold atoms, right? Because it's so hot. I mean, and right. the temperature you can get in cold atoms for compared to Fermi energy is quite high. Right, so actually uh, this is absolutely right. So one would think that cold atoms are very cold, but for, in terms of fermions, they're actually pretty hot. So when you look at this phase diagram, the experimentally accessible regime uh, in ultra-cold atoms is uh, maybe uh, a regime above this, uh, uh, certainly way above the superconducting dome, way above a uh, striped order, uh, phases and above, uh, roughly in the regime which I was hatching now here. So what we can, right, this is also why I kind of chose this, this way of motivating this topic, because I want to motivate that uh, these cuprates have very exotic, uh, not yet fully understand, understood uh, regimes in the phase diagram which are reachable with current technology, right? So we are interested uh, essentially in this regime of an yeah, intermediate temperature where the temperatures are below the uh, below the um, temperature of magnetic excitations or magnetic excitation energy, uh, but, uh, but still hot in terms of a, uh, in, in comparison to a, to a cold solid. Excuse me, if I can yes. make a, a quick comment, is that uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in this high temperature regime, the linear resistivity comes from the temperature dependence of the compressibility. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. And so in some sense, this very high temperature regime is quite well uh, understood. What is, and you know, it depends who you talk to, but uh, some people try, you know, like, try, like, <laughs> like to call it uh, bad metal, if you want, where you're above the, yes. uh, the Yoffi-Regel uh, limit. And the Precisely. more difficult piece is the, really the low temperature uh, one, which, and, and then you can, People talk about strange metal, so I, I would okay, say okay. it's a little bit not 
quite the same thing to talk about strange metal all the way from high to low temperature, although it's quite surprising that sometimes the slope doesn't change very much. Yeah. Yeah. So you say what, what I should actually call strange metal is somehow maybe when I blow away the superconducting dome by magnetic fields uh, and then find some exotic uh, properties. Is this? Uh... Well, as long as the compressibility is uh, temperature independent, I would say is the and which is basically always the case or you know very slight temperature dependence and in solids is the uh, is the strange uh, strange metal but in this uh, in this cold atom uh, experiments the compressibility becomes temperature dependence and in fact gives you know with the einstein relation that uh, conductivity is I equal see. to uh, compressibility times diffusion constant Diffusion constant saturates and the compressibility becomes temperature uh, dependent. So the, the physics is in but some way. Uh -huh. Okay, ah, you say because okay because of the doping because the temperature is of course way below uh, charge ordering and, 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 and spin ordering still. But you say there's still a significant dependence of the uh, of the of the com of the compressibility on temperature in that regime, which is currently reached. Yeah, in this Brown et al. experiment, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Okay. Good. Um, so maybe take this with a grain of salt. Salt, uh, and then maybe the other uh, regime here uh, would be this pseudo gap uh, regime, where uh, very nice APES experiments, uh, yeah, maybe already two decades ago, have shown uh, that one gets very interesting uh, APES response, which looks a bit like an arc. Uh, so this is this colored response here. So instead of a a closed uh, surface, Fermi surface, uh, they only see a Fermi arc. And the question is, is this uh, due to the fact that maybe quasi-particle weight is suppressed here at high momenta, or is this due to some other, other, other reasons, right? And, and some people put forward also the idea that in that regime, uh, an electron may fractionalize uh, maybe into a spin-on and into a, a hole-on or a charge-on or something. So there are many, yeah, okay. There, of course, I mean, there's a long standing history. I mean, there are many, many proposals for effective descriptions of the individual regimes here in the phase diagram, but I think it's still fair to say that somehow uh, it's not quite clear how to benchmark these, these uh, theories and how to really assess uh, what, is, what is going on microscopically. Good, so now let me go uh, to these quantum gas microscopes. So it's widely believed that some of the essential uh, physics of this Kubrate phenomenology, which I've just introduced, been introducing to you, that this is captured by the Fermi-Hubbard model. The Fermi-Hubbard model describes fermions of two species, which are hopping on a lattice. These fermions can be now electrons with two spin states, or they can be fermionic atoms, for instance, lithium atoms, uh, where two hyperfine states of the lithium are used uh, to, to kind of encode the two species. I just colored them red and blue in this picture down here. And okay, the atoms can tunnel from one lattice side to another one. This is given by the tunneling amplitude T or hopping. And then we have screened Coulomb interactions when two uh, uh, different species are sitting on top of each other on a single lattice side, uh, then, oh, sorry, yeah. then, um, then one has to pay a Coulomb energy essentially. And this energy in the ultracold atom settings is widely, uh, widely tunable because of some techniques from, from atomic physics, which is called Feshbach resonance, essentially. So you can be tuned from small to large, essentially. The hopping can also be independently tuned by the, the depth of the lattice. And well, the, um, so this Hubbard model can be faithfully realized uh, in an ultracold atom setting, and that is very useful on the one hand because we don't have an exact uh, solution to the two-dimensional Hubbard model, an exact analytical solution, but also numerical techniques, exact numerical techniques, I would say, I mean, there has been a lot of progress, of course, in developing numerical techniques, but an exact numerical solution is also not uh, uh, available in that regime. The standard candidate would be quantum Monte Carlo, but there uh, we have the sign problem, the MLG results uh, suffer from various entanglement problems, and uh, DMFT results are also some extensions of DMFT, which capture quite a lot of correlations, but are also not an exact uh, description of the system. And the, the advantage here is that the ultracold atoms uh, settings, they're really faithfully realizing the Hubbard model on all energy scales. 
So this means that we can now, compared to solid state experiments, also look at short distance physics, which normally is not universally uh, captured because it's in high energy properties, not universally captured in a, in a solid. And this really kind of, I think, revolutionizes a little bit the way of how we can think about the, the problem. So let me just start out by explaining in a bit more detail again what would happen if we start out at half filling. As I said, half filling means this uh, one atom per site on our square lattice. And I also assume that we have zero magnetization, so there are as many red as, as there are blue atoms. Then at height, then, and, and we are always interested in the limit of large U, right? Because the Coup rays they have strong interactions. So we, we want to have U, the interactions to being bigger than the bandwidth. And so at high temperatures, entropy wins. So arbitrary configurations uh, are kind of contributing. You have something like a yeah, metallic type of state. When you decrease temperature, what happens then is that it's favorable to put one uh, charge, one fermion per lattice side, because then you avoid uh, paying the, the interaction energy U, right? So this is now for temperatures much below uh, the hopping. But then we also do know that there is an additional gain of energy due to quantum fluctuations because what we could have is that when anti-aligned spins can lower the energy by virtually hopping on a neighboring side and back or the other way around, right? So this is the so-called phenomenon of super exchange. Uh, and this has a time scale of hopping squared over U. It's quite easy to understand just from perturbation theory, matrix element squared is second order perturbation theory, right? The matrix element squared divided by the energy which we have to pay in the virtual state. So it's hopping squared divided by U. And so at very low temperatures, we get also spin one. And of course here, this is very oversimplified, the picture which I have because I'm drawing here a nail state, but we do know uh, quantum mechanic fluctuations lower uh, the, uh, the, the energy of the nail state. Um, which are very important. And also, we do know in, in the strictly two-dimensional case, long-range order due to Mermin Wagner theorem can only be att attained at strictly zero temperature. So at finite temperature, we will always have a finite correlation length. And of course, because it's an SU2 symmetric uh, point, uh, we also don't have a BKD scenario. So it's just a uh, finite correlation length at finite. Right, so the correlation length of this antiferromagnetic correlation indeed diverges with decreasing temperatures very strongly. It diverges uh, exponentially with one over temperature. And this has been, was one of the first experiments which, uh, which really probed correlate, strong correlation physics, I would say, in these quantum gas microscopes. So here I show you the temperature of the system as a function of the hopping amplitude, T, and you see they can go down to about a quarter uh, uh, of, the, of the hopping in temperature, but not much lower. I mean, this is kind of the, the, the boundary what, what they have. But I also would like to argue that it's not such a big of a deal because when you look at the correlation length, then it starts at that regime, it starts being on the order of 10 lattice sites. And it turns out that these ultra cold atom settings, they are actually pretty small. They're about yeah, 20 by 20 or something like this. I mean, it's already too much. I mean, it's like about, uh, so it's like a radial object with about 100 sites. So in that sense, because of finite size effects in these quantum gas microscopes, it looks as if there's antiferromagnetic order across the whole system because the correlation length exceeds the length, uh, exceeds the length of the system, right? So, so, so far, uh, just to tell you a bit uh, where, what the technological limitations are at the moment, but also what has been achieved. And I think now it's time to talk a bit more about the measurement procedure, what they kind of can implement in these ultra cold atom settings. The idea is there that they can really use a very, very good microscope to make Sorry, snapshots. Can I ask, uh, what, what limits the size of 20 by 20? Is that the fact that you can't get a flat band uh, potential or right. is on the one hand, okay, what, what limits the size? On the one hand, you have to trap the atoms uh, so that they are not falling off the cliff with a trapping potential. Yeah. And you have to, you're not allowed to make this too shallow because then they're just falling off the cliff, right? And, and you don't have any atoms. 
This is the one thing which they have to optimize. And in that experiment, actually, by Markus Greiner, it's even a bit more complicated. It's a bit indicated here that the sample is really here in the center of the microscope. And outside, there is a thermal cloud, which is used to carry away entropy. And so the whole system is already pretty big, and, and, and it can't get much bigger in the current. You would have to, yeah, to make big box-shaped potentials with optics, which is a, a pain, apparently. So, I mean, um, and, and, and this is, yeah, this is what they can do at the moment. But of course, I mean, they're always interested in getting things larger. I think they're a bit better. The idea is now Emanuel's group is trying to, to go to something like 40 by 40. Uh, so they're getting there. There is a steady improvement uh, in system size, essentially. And, also and, you can, and, and you say that one can think of this more or less as, as zero temperature in the sense that it's anti-ferromagnetic order all the way. Uh, well, zero temperature, I wouldn't call it like that because you certainly have a density matrix which describes your state. But I think it, it, it resembles maybe a little bit the phenomenology of the phase diagram of cuprates because there you have a weak interlayer coupling between the, between the two-dimensional layers, which, makes, which, give, which gives you a finite uh, temperature phase transition for the antiferromagnet, as I have indicated in my phase diagram in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And here, due to the finite size, we also have something like antiferromagnetic correlations see, uh, yeah. Through, yeah. throughout the setting. This is a, a, a clear, cleaner analogy. I see. Okay. Certainly a mixed state uh, what the system is. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. And, and here also, this is what I, what I want, want to emphasize, and this is the cool thing about these experiments. You have your quantum many-body state described by some density matrix, and then they can measure individual snapshots, or let's think maybe about the wave functions, maybe simpler. So let's just think about the zero temperature wave functions, and they can measure a snapshot of this state. What does that mean? A snapshot means a Fock configuration of my atoms. And they are sampled, so you repeat these measurements for a thousand times, and then you're sampling your, uh, your, your many-body wave function in that way. And the, the probability with which the snapshots are occurring, they are sampled according to the probability amplitudes of the wave function squared, so the probabilities, uh, of the individual Fock configurations, okay? And, but the, the trick is somehow that we can have, then we can ca calculate not only nearest neighbor correlations, next nearest neighbor correlations, but in principle, out of this snapshot information, we can access full counting statistics, right? And arbitrarily high order correlations. And, and that's a very big advantage in an analyzing this, this data. Also that we have real space resolution uh, to atomic limit, right? So that's what I want to advocate here. This is why I got uh, excited about this, uh, looking at this, at this problem. Sorry, one more question. So uh, there's this um, even odd, you know, measurement um, thing that usually happens yeah. in the system. But in this case, uh, is that not a problem? Because you, I guess you have fermions and then it can separately resolve the, so is, is the up and down state equivalent to unoccupied state in the, in the measurement or not? Yeah, yeah, it depends on the experiment. I mean, uh, Immanuel's experiment can have spin resolution, Marcus is not, and then it's the job of us theoreticians to find clever observables which get rid of this deficiency in the, in the measurement, right? But okay. that, that certainly uh, uh, would be great to have also full uh, spin resolution. Right? So this is currently, I mean, spin, Duplon resolution, I would say, right? So, uh, uh, particularly, uh, so um, two species on one side are uh, measured as, as holes. In Marcus's experiment, in Imander's experiment, he can separate them in two different layers and, uh, and, and do spin resolved measurements. Uh, so this is really depending on technology. Marcus is also upgrading, I mean, it's kind of just a matter of a uh, month <laughs> or maybe years. Uh, okay. Right. And now, here on the top, uh, bottom right, I show you one particular snapshot. Uh, which has been taken by a quantum gas microscope of this antiferromagnetic order. And here you see, uh, it's essentially a bit of a funny color map what they have. White means maybe spin down, black means spin up, and blue is in between, okay? <laughs> so uh, uh, this is what they see here. But you see a checkerboard pattern, which means that you see uh, antiferromagnetic correlations throughout the sample. And the point here, is however, you have SU2 symmetry. So this is a lucky snapshot, right? Because the antiferromagnet can point in an arbitrary direction. It's not that every snapshot looks like this. It's just a, a out of the thousand of snapshots which they did, a couple of them look like this. Okay, good. 
Okay, that's about antifern, but what I would like to talk about today actually is about punching holes into the antiferromagnet. And uh, we are still interested in the regime of strong interactions. And then maybe, I mean, uh, uh, when, one, when one looks at this case that one punches, punches in a couple of holes into, um, into an antiferromagnet, then we can still look at the following local configuration. So we can, in the limit of large U, we only have the following local states. There can be a spin down, a spin up, or a hole. And double occupancies we uh, just treat virtually, essentially, uh, in a, in, when you do a Schrieffer-Wolf uh, transformation, something like this, right? So then, essentially, what you arrive at is the DJ model, the so-called DJ model. It describes the spin exchange. This would be the part, which is really what I was just showing with my, with my hands previously, that uh, you can virtually, when you have spin up and down on neighboring sides, you can virtually tunneling to the neighbor and back. This would give you CC interactions or you can virtually tunnel to your neighbor and the other one comes over, this would be the flip-flop or exchange interactions. So this is kind of uh, the spin part of the story. But since we also punched in a couple of holes, we have to treat the whole motion. And this just, when you do this calculation carefully, uh, it is just the hopping of holes on this square, uh, square lattice. And you have to project it in such a way that you avoid double occupancies. So sometimes you write like, uh, this like this. If you still keep as creation and annihilation operators the fermions, then you have to write the projection operators. When you just say a single hole is hopping, uh, then you could think of this as hole hopping. Uh, so these are equivalent ways of, of looking at this. Okay, but that's the Hamiltonian and the model which is realized in, in the experiment. And this is the model which we want to uh, study in a bit more detail. But before we go to the full-fledged 2D uh, case, I'd like to give you some intuition about the 1D problem because it's significantly simpler and it carries really nice physics. So the idea is that we have a, uh, a, charge, a charge configuration and somewhere we punch in a hole. And what happens there is actually you can think of this hole in the following way that it fractionalizes into a spin excitation, spin on, and into a uh, charge on or a hole on. Why is that so? Because let's look at, you know, maybe you've heard about it already. This is the uh, famous spin charge separation in one dimensions. So spin excitations travel with a different velocity than charge excitations in one dimension. And let me give you a simple uh, explanation for that. So here I have a configuration. So this would be my charge excitation, the charge on the bunch in the hole. And then here uh, would be, um, uh, okay, what I have done now compared to the previous configuration, I jump with my hole once to the right. And then I make a domain wall. I don't get antiferromagnetic co couplings, but I get a ferromagnetic uh, coupling on the neighboring side. And that's a spin on excitation, okay? So now when the hole moves another time, it doesn't do any harm anymore in one dimension because we have up, down, up, down pattern for the rest of the motion, right? This is what, uh, what happens uh, here. And the, however, what also can happen due to the spin part of my, of my Hamiltonian, we can make flip-flops. And that leads to the hopping of the spin on, but it stays on, on the same sublattice uh, as, as, uh, as, it, as it was. So this is kind of this yellow point here. And so you see, these are two independent processes. Spin can travel, charge can travel, velocities are different, uh, charge is faster uh, than, than, oh no, so the spin is fast. Uh, what is it now? Uh, uh, in the same, oh no, it depends. On, okay, uh, uh, so spin, the spin dynamics goes with uh, the exchange, with the super exchange J, which is the smaller unit, and the charge is with the hopping. So charge is faster than the spin. Okay, good. Ah, yeah, we can hop another time. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the this is what is happening in the system. And here the important part, just to emphasize it again, there is one spin defect, and the rest, I mean, doesn't really care, right? The hole can just hop through the system, and there won't be any additional defects. And if you want, we can call this distance between the uh, charge on and the spin on, as a, we can call it a string. But the point is, there has been charge separations. The strings can become arbitrarily long, and uh, spin ons and charge ons are not bound together. They're just deconfined. We 
can call it, right? Because they can separate without any additional energy arbitrarily uh, far from each other. So what we have uh, been revisiting was the APES angular resolved photo emission spectral, uh, spectra uh, of, um, of, uh, of these one dimensional systems. I mean, this has been studied maybe almost to death already previously, but there were a couple of open questions and also how uh, we proposed how to measure these APES spectra in an ultra cold atom setting. Uh, so these were kind of the contributions which we had in this work, uh, was one of the first works by Annabelle. And uh, so she evaluated uh, here the single hole spectral function, which is, yeah, yeah, you, you, may, you may know what this, this is. So it's the expectation value of uh, creating a hole in the ground state squared, and then you have to count, I mean, uh, which kind of energies are matching, where can I, where can I add a hole uh, essentially to the system? Yeah, and this is then still a thermal state uh, of, of our system. In some sense, you can think about this as Fermi's golden rule if you want. This would be, again, matrix element squared, and this would be the phase space factor from Fermi's golden and a typical spectrum is then looking like this. Yeah? It has uh, kind of, yeah, this would be at finite temperatures for a finite size system. So this is why we get this discrete set of peaks. But this is also intentional here um, because I advocated previously that we have spin charge separation. So what that means in turn for the spectrum is that my spectral function A of K and omega can be written as a convolution of a spin-on contribution and a holon contribution because they are independent particles. So it's a convolution in, in, the, uh, in, in, in frequency and momentum space, right? And uh, yeah, so okay, this would be the convolution just written out. And this indeed works because when you look at the spectrum above, this is sometimes referred to as spectral building principle in these one dimensional systems. We get a charge on BART with a big bandwidth the bandwidth is T, and then we get a spin-on part, and the spin-on has a small bandwidth of J, okay? And you can see that there are many, many spin-ons, kind of, you can add them to each charge-on, and then you get the, the pattern uh, which we find in, in the exact diagonalization studies. So far, so good. So what was... Sorry, Michael, Th this would depend, the, the, the fact that you measure a convolution of a spin-on and a hole-on would also depend on what kind of probe you're using. Uh, if the probe is unable to, say, flip a spin. Oh, no, what we really do is we really think of shooting out an electron uh, out of our system, and this creates a charge and a spin-on simultaneously. And then, right. however, we know from the kinematics of spin-ons and charge-ons that they're doing their independent thing, so uh, the result for the spectral function, which is ultimately measured in the experiment, is a convolution of the individual supports. Right, right. Because of well, this generally, event. though, if you if you had a, a spin, you know, selective probe, then you could just measure the spin on, and that's what you would do. Ah, and that's important now. A spin selective probe can only flip a spin. Right. And flipping a spin creates at least it creates two spin ons because it's a spin one excitation. Right. And this is the, the unique thing about APES, that you're creating a spin a half excitation plus a, a, a charge, right? And that's really what I will dwell on a little bit in the second part of my, of my talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me, so the, the formula you give for the, the whole uh, spectrum is not the way you measure it, right? The way you measure it is just by looking at these pictures you showed on the previous page or? Ah, okay, how we can measure that in a quantum gas microscope? Right. Yeah, okay, there one has to, okay, there, there are tricks. I mean, you can use radio frequency uh, spectroscopy to absorb into a third level. This would be the easier trick. This has been actually also done by Vasim Bakker on the attractive side of the Hubbard model, not on the conventional side of the Hubbard model. And, uh, and, 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 and another way would be to really use a floquet type scheme of lattice modulation to make this transfer uh, um, uh, of the states. So this is what we have proposed in this, in this setting. It has not been realized yet, our proposal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So what I want to emphasize here, however, is that here there is spectral weight at the spin-on branch, but if I would follow the spin-on, there would be also a branch over here, but it's invisible, okay? And that was actually, I mean, people tried to answer that in various ways in previous studies, but I found it not very convincing. And so we, we thought, I mean, let's just revisit the problem again 
and look at Zhao Gang Wen's book and uh, do a, a kind of a make a spin liquid mean field ansatz because you know a Lattice liquid is nothing else than a spin liquid. Make this ansatz, uh, create, write down a button theory for this for this approach where we have a creation operate, operator for our charge on where we remove our spin on. This is essentially what the annihilation operator of a full electron does. So we separate this degree of freedoms, perform a mean field calculation, and then voila, it turns out we get a Fermi C of spin ons as the ground state. And now it becomes very clear why we see this behavior from above uh, for our spin on dispersion. Because um, at low temperatures, we really have a sharp Fermi C here. There are not much, there's not much going on. It's a very sharp edge, uh, what we have here. Uh, and therefore, this means that uh, we can only occupy, or we can only excite, we can only shoot out holes out of the occupied Fermi C. So we can only get spectral weight for wave vector below pi over two where my Fermi C of spin ons is occupied. Above pi over two, we don't see any weight. This is because there is simply no spin on uh, at, this, uh, at these energies, okay? And this is uncovered actually by this, uh, by this, by this simple button mean field ansatz. And it's pretty nice also, just as a comment, if you're interested in that, we can also add a spin anisotropy to the system, for instance, a set uh, uh, JC in this in the um, Heisenberg, I mean in the spin s dot s term is not s dot s in an SU two invariant case sense, but we apply a a set anisotropy stronger set couplings maybe between the set set terms of the spins, and in that case there should be a very slow exponential opening of the gap, and we reproduce that almost with this mean field theory, but with a different exponent in the exponential. So normally it should be uh, e to the j over j minus jc with minus sign in front, and we get the same e to the minus j over jc by the square root of it, but still a very slow opening of the gap. So I, I found this kind of remarkable because it's a very simple technique. You don't need beta answers or whatever uh, to solve for this for this opening. But that's just a side comment. Anyway, I mean, I think with that we could understand somehow uh, what is uh, why the spectral weight here is missing at the at the higher at the higher moment. And now, maybe big, uh, big hypothesis or conjecture. I don't know. Um, so we, what I what I advocated here was that we have spectral weight at wave vector smaller than pi over two, no spectral weight at wave vector larger than pi over two. I don't know. I mean, let's be very bold. Look at the two D case. Make a diagonal cut here. And then again, this would be the pi over two line uh, in my case. So we have spectral weight here and none here. So can can we somehow relate this really to a loss of a, of a of 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 quasi particle weight that we just see one half of the of the of the of the Fermi of the Fermi pocket of the Fermi surface, right? So let's. This is kind of kind of motivating motivating um, us now to go to the two, full two dimensional case and uh, crank up our numerical machinery, which we have been developing um, also in, uh, uh, jointly with Frank Borman's group uh, over the last couple of years. And the idea now is that we make, that we perform exact numerical simulations of a two-dimensional antiferromagnet where we punch in a hole at some point, so somewhere here, as, as indicated again by this um, uh, a dot here. And we want to exactly solve for the time evolution with the caveat that we can't do truly two-dimensional systems, but rather what we are solving is cylinders um, uh, uh, of the system. Of course, we have to be very careful because we do know from Hordain's conjecture that there are even odd effects and whatever, but we can uh, do this, the, uh, the study here of the dynamics carefully, uh, look at convergence of the properties with the cylinder circumference, with the properties, with the, with the bond dimensions of our matrix product says, let me not go into details. And this is what we have done uh, as good as we can. Uh, and, 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 and the result of it is shown here uh, in, in this plot on the right hand side. Before I go to the spectra, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, real-time evolution of the whole. It's complementary. The probe is not one-on-one -on -one, uh, to the same thing because in the R spectrum, we are projecting back to the one-hole states. Okay, This is why the, the evolution of a whole has different information. It's not the same. It's not precisely the same, uh, the two, two kind of things. 
Right. So what we are measuring is the Manhattan distance of the hole uh, from where it has been initiated as a function of time. So what does the Manhattan distance mean? You know, it's just this distance which was motivated from uh, which is motivated from, uh, from the roadmap of New York. So um, essentially a Manhattan distance of one is this, two is this, three, four, five, six, uh, oh no, there's no graph. So this would be maybe the shorter distance of that, but uh, we are just counting, we're not counting the Euclidean distance, but we are counting uh, distances in straight lines. But I mean, it's all the same. I just need this for later, later convenience um, that, we, that we count bonds as distance instead of um, instead of uh, Euclidean distances. But whatever distance measure you like more, you can think about. So let's inject this hole uh, and look at the time evolution of this hole in this two-dimensional setting. Looks a bit messy on the first side. So these are three different curves for different ratios of hopping over super exchange. And remember, super exchange J is 4 t squared over u. So this would just mean that we are changing the interaction strength uh, in our system. So these are a couple of values here, which we are looking at. And okay, what do we see? When we rescale time in units of the super exchange, what we see is that at late times, uh, all the curves are more or less parallel. Okay, so they are, okay, I can't draw very straight lines here, but they are more or less they are more or less uh, they are more or less parallel uh, with respect to to each other. Okay, if I rescale times in unit of one over the hopping, then the initial time evolution collapses. Okay, so that's the yeah numerical report uh, of the data. And maybe because I mean you might not be very convinced. I mean that I say these curves are parallel and they are linear, growing in time. This is what I I want to emphasize, but we are running into finite size effects actually here. But there are other things than just the whole motion which we can look at because the whole is the fast object in our system because we have strong coupling and the spin is the slow motion. So J, the super exchange is small and hopping T is large. This is the limit what we are looking at. And what that means is that when you look at the distance of my hole, it propagates away from where I punched it in in, in, uh, in the beginning very quickly and then seeing later increase may be difficult. And so what, what we can also do is, we can look at the energy density correlator of the spins. So what I mean is like S dot S correlators on neighboring sides and see how those are propagating up through the system. That would have the advantage that we don't have this fast hole which is already all over the place uh, in this kind of probe. And when we do that, then we get this kind of uh, result. And here we nicely see after some transient we see a, I would say, pretty good linear growth of this energy density of spins. Um, and we can also do this for different chains. I have not had in this, this in this data, but these are all parallel curves, uh, essentially, for the spin correlations. At some point, we get to finite size effects, as usual. I still show, show them to really show the limitations of what we can calculate, right? But somewhere there's a bending over. Okay, so, ah, okay, well, yeah, so, Okay, so we have these two regimes, one regimes which collapses with one over T, one regimes which collapse, collapses with one over J, essentially. So what is the, what, what could be a potential explanation of what is going on? So the, let's take our spin on charge on picture from before, from the one dimensional case. When we now think about it in that way, and we do know that we have the fast charge on and the slow spin on, what would happen? the fast charge on is moving around through the system. And it, when it does so, it exchanges with the spins. For instance, here I show you a pattern where a charge hops two times to the, or three times, one, two, three times to the right. So what happens is that they make my, uh, here's my spin on defect. This was the first one where I have three dangling wrong bonds, but then a carry along with it a, a string of defects actually, because we are now not in a one dimensional chain, but in a two dimensional chain and there are defects uh, with respect to the upper line and the lower line, okay? So it costs me more and more energy when you take this classical picture to depart my charge on uh, from the spin on. 
and the energy increases linearly uh, uh, with the distance of this string, and it has an energy prefactor uh, which is given by the super exchange coupling. Okay, so we have a competition. Of course, the hole wants to delocalize because uh, it uh, because be because it gains kinetic energy from that, right? But it also has to pay energy from this linear confinement from the string. And that means that we have an emergent length scale of the system, right? We have two energy scales, we match them, we get a length scale out. So the holon or charge on, these are used synonymously. I don't know what the better term is. Some people prefer colon, some people prefer charge on. And so uh, there will be a typical length scale of this object, how far it can depart. And the point is also, let's think back to our quantum mechanics course. In the strong coupling limit, what we can have is actually we can think about the problem in a born Oppenheimer way because we have a large separation of energy scales. The whole on is really moving like uh, very widely around the spin on and then slowly the spin on will start uh, to, uh, to propagate around by some spin frames. Okay, so this picture has actually put forward by Beran, Boblon, and Laughlin decades ago and has been worked out in much more detail by Fabian uh, during his postdoc with Eugene. So this work is the one, if you're interested in how you can apply that uh, to make uh, direct theoretical calculations, this is the work to look at, okay? So we apply, so what is the idea then now? Then the idea would be my quantum anybody wave function consists of my, uh, of my, my spin on which I have created and I'm looking at now at relatively short times, and then the uh, charge on is moving around. It's moving around in different uh, ways, and we get the superposition of these different configurations, right? It can be upwards, right, just upwards, upwards, left, or whatever, I mean, uh, thing the, the, the charge on can do. And with that, it, it, it kind of dresses the spin on, and in, in some sense, it's like a Polaron picture, right? Because we have now uh, the spin on, which is dressed with some fluctuations from, the, from, the, uh, from our charge on, which is, which is dangling around. When you average, you get something like a Polaron, Polaronic effect, if you like. So there's many terminologies, it's maybe a bit confusing, but I hope I, uh, I keep this uh, to a limit. But now I advocated so much that we have these quantum gas microscopes. So what can we do? We can make a picture of our wave function. This is this checkerboard, which I'm showing you here. Now, this is, of course, all idealized, but this is what we do, and this is the philosophy here. And when a string now, a string is now indicated, so I punch in my hole here, and my hole moves one step to the right, two steps to the bottom, one step to the right. The new spin configuration, which I arrive at, is kind of what I draw here. Now I can, can subtract the bare checkerboard and they find the string. And that's the idea now, right? We can take snapshots from a quantum many wave, many body wave function, subtract the, the checkerboard pattern, extract strings, and see what is the distribution of strings which are attached to the hole. Is this easy to do when uh, the spins are, I mean, not in the Z direction or something? Precisely, I mean, this is precisely the caveat is not an easing model which we are looking at. We are looking at SU2 invariance, but uh, still, uh, okay, uh, it turns out that you can faithfully detect strings in there. We can also simulate it in some sense by taking Heisenberg data, punching holes, draw strings, right, in the, in the holes according to a probability distribution, and then measure in that way uh, whether we can recover the probability distribution. And it turns out that, that due to SU2 invariance, we will get a constant background uh, and on top of that, however, we can rather faithfully, by some clever algorithms, it's a bit more complex than what I'm showing you here, uh, but in that way, we can extract... Yeah, I guess it's quite complex, yeah. ...and extract string <laughs> yeah. That's the cool new thing, actually. Right, okay. I mean, we, cool. It's a new way of thinking about, uh, I would say, the structure of the many-body state, because, yeah, because we can have this real space uh, information kind of hidden in the... In the Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty slow today, but maybe I mean, let's um, not be too fast. Uh, rather, I get things across clearly. So, so really, uh, maybe it is good if you um, end up, you know, finish up in five minutes. Is that possible? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we just have to toss away a couple of things, but that's fine. Maybe let me let me 
finish one thing in a very pedagogical way and then I rush uh, uh, through, <laughs> through the rest of your talk. Just uh, okay. give you a nice insight. Right, so here, or what I want to say now is what we have in our system is we have free charge on motion which creates the string, but then confinement sets in because of the linear confinement potential. This would lead to a saturation. And then there can be a free center of mass motion by spin on dynamics because these, those are of course not stuck completely. And this is what we conjecture the whole curve in the dynamics would be. But what we can also do, we can sample snapshots from, from our matrix product state. This is also possible with some techniques. And then we can measure string patterns out of that. And from there, what we find is indeed that we see an increase of the string pattern, but then it quickly saturates the average of the strings. And that's precisely what I said. At that point, confinement sets in. Maybe, I mean, I don't know whether this is really true of finite size effect or whatever, but we see some oscillations, which you would even see uh, for uh, when you form such a string and then it dies out. Um, oh, I mean, it dies out. It like reduces contrast a little bit. Okay. And we can also then compare this to a full-fledged analytical theory, no fitting parameter, which puts in these ingredients which I have been presenting to you. Uh, there is a lot of techno te technology involved in the background here, but as I said, no fitting parameter, and we pretty much uh, recover what we see in the exact numerical simulations. And that's for us very reassuring, reassuring that this picture which we are advocating here uh, seems to be capturing at least this intermediate time dynamics uh, of this whole in this two-dimensional system. Okay, so the next step would be to calculate the ARPA spectra. I just want to emphasize the new information here is that we don't now have free spinons and holons which are moving separately, but we rather have a holon or charge on which is bound to the spinon. So momentum is not shared between spinon and, and holon, but rather the full momentum dependence is carried by the spinon if this picture holds. And of course, this is now should be seen more, I would say, sorry, I mean, maybe should be seen more like this, right? So this is our theoretical picture. The full spectral function is therefore just a convolution over frequencies and not over momenta. So the momentum dependence of my Polaron branch, which is the thing here downstairs, the lowest branch in the spectrum, this would be entirely the spin on, uh, the, the spin on, uh, carried by the spin on. So we have with APES in strong coupling, this is our hypothesis, or maybe uh, even yeah, conjecture if you want, or proposal, if you want to formulate it even stronger, uh, we would be able to measure the dispersion of a single spin on. And that's unique because as already kind of indicated previously, when you do neutron scattering, you create at least two spin ons. Two spin ons are strongly interacting with each other. Uh, and this is very different compared to, uh, to what we have here. So it's a new way of probing uh, spin on physics uh, in, uh, in disguise, if you will. Okay, good. So that, 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 that's one observation. So we get a clear quasi-particle peak here at low energies. The quasi-particle peak is repeated at higher energies. I will come back to that in a minute. And there's a suppressed quasi-particle weight at pi pi. And so maybe, I mean, kind of this goes back to my previous conjecture. Uh, maybe this is kind of this reduced quasi-particle weight uh, when you cross when you cross the Bermuda zone, you know, this is the thing, the Fermi arc would be here in APES. Here there is no spectral weight. And this drop of the spectral weight becomes even steeper uh, when we dope in more holes, which you can do in a variational wave function approach. Yeah. So this is also in this paper here by, uh, by Annabelle. Okay, so another thing, oh, so I need to clean, clean up. Uh, so uh, another thing is that these geometric strings would lead to a confinement potential. You know, linear confinement is a standard problem from quantum mechanics. The solutions are airy functions. We do know the scaling of the energies of the airy functions. When we translate this to our problem, this would lead to a scaling of the ground state. Energy is J over T to the power of two thirds, but also of, there should also exist vibrational higher states. And the energy difference should also scale as J over T to the two thirds. And this, this has not been looked at in previous uh, literature before, this energy difference. So this would be this energy difference in our upper spectrum, which I draw here at one uh, magnetic polaron, the first vibrational state essentially here. 
And the, the gap here is very weakly dependent on the wave vector, right? So from that, you can extract this dependence of delta E as a function of the couplings. And we can do that numerically, and we see a very nice linear or I mean, a linear dependence when we plot it as a function of j over t to the two thirds. So, and the point is the intersection of this energy change is really zero in our data. And that's very important because that's the prediction also which comes from the airy, airy functions. All of them carry the same coefficient. May, maybe you don't remember, but this has been worked out by Bulevsky uh, in this old paper, or I mean, it's also written in our paper again, or it's just the airy problem in general. So the differences of the energies would just have the scaling, but there is no constant. The constant is canceling. It's the same constant. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say here. Maybe one word, I mean, we have then studied also with Markus Greiner's group and Daniel Greif was the leading postdoc of this group. When we dope now really strongly the Hubbard model, we can extract the string count per side and, the, and compare with, with, with uh, different analytical theories. One of them is just sprinkling randomly of holes as we expect it should completely fail and it does in comparison to experiment. And then we compare to different theories. One is this string theory, which I advocated now, doesn't have any fitting parameter. And one is a resonance valence bond state and Anderson uh, spin liquid with nearest neighbor singlets and uh, well, an electron, which is kind of in cycling one black hat is picking up a biflux. So this is this kind of biflux theory, which we were using here. And it turns out when you look at the, at the two um, curves, theory curves, well, Maybe one could say that the, that the curves are better fitted by the geometric string theory, but there's not a big, big deal of a difference, right? I mean, uh, all of them are pretty good. And without maybe one thing which I want to emphasize is that for large uh, string, for large hole doping, the string theory predicts a negative sign of the diagonal correlators. This is because when you move by a string, then uh, you know you exchange, you exchange the role of your neighbors. So when you have a appreciably high density of holes, then it could be that the nearest neighbor correlations, next as the diagonal correlations here, that they become negative. And this is also seen in the experiment. And this is not, at least up to the doping regimes which you're looking at for the biflux theory, is not captured with this biflux theory. But other quantities, it may be slight difference in the other way around, right? So that maybe biflux theory is working a little bit better uh, than string theory. So this brought us to the uh, statement of Steve Kivilson from a couple of years ago where he was saying that the theoretical problem is so hard that there isn't any obvious criterion for what is right. <laughs> so uh, it's very hard to say, depending on the observables which we select, one theory might be favored over the other. So what we thought is let's take a machine, let's take artificial intelligence uh, to kind of try to learn which theory without any bias is kind of more predictive uh, with respect to the to the to the uh, to the to the uh, experimental data, so the idea is that we train a convolutional neural network with the snapshots. We feed in theories A and B. We show it the experiment, and it sorts then the experimental snapshots either to theory A and B. And if all the snapshots are sorted, for instance, to geometric strings, then we know that experiment is more compatible with geometric strings. If it's the other way, it's the other way around. So we can do that. And for small doping, indeed, uh, the geometric string theory is favored by our convolutional neural network where we don't put in any bias, right? Up to 10% doping, say, uh, we see some clear um, advantages of uh, geometric string the uh, theory over biflux theory. So maybe uh, this gives us some more insights uh, of which theory is more predictive in general. Of course, it doesn't tell me which theory is right. This is anyway not provable uh, in general. Uh, but uh, we can have another new theory which we feed into our neural network and may work better. Anyway, so this brings me to the end. Just flash the slides. We have discussed how Barton theory provides some useful insights into the dynamics of doped antiferromagnets and how we can use neural network to characterize states. Our big endeavor now is to dope uh, more exotic quantum magnets, for instance, triangular magnets. But that's up for future discussions. And really, who should be thanked? Uh, very much for all the progress here is Annabelle um, uh, and Wilhelm and Fabian, uh, with whom I mean, who did mo most of the heavy lifting. And of course, all my, uh, all the collaborations with uh, the rest of the uh, gang here um, uh, helped me learn and understand the topic very much.
And with that, I'd like to thank you with your attention and I hope you enjoyed this perspective on holes in antithermodynamics. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, that, was a, that was a very nice talk. Um, so we are running late. Uh, so maybe if people have some pressing questions, they can ask now. And maybe um, you can talk to Michael. Uh, he's indicated he's, he has some time to talk between 2 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. So anyway, uh, are there any questions? Uh, okay, so maybe I can I can uh, start uh, just a more uh, broad perspective. I mean, where do we go? I mean, are, are we stuck at these temperature regimes in the cold atom systems? Can we go to the lowest temperatures? Uh, well, I think there are ideas around how to make the system even cooler, but the point is somehow it's uh, tricky, but it will be done over over years. I mean. I don't think, I mean, whether we can really reach so low temperatures that we see uh, charge ordering, stripes, superconductivity is an open question, but uh, uh, certainly, I mean, people have not thought that they could reach even temperatures below the super exchange, right? And now it has been reached after a couple of years. And so I think there will be steady progress uh, to further cooling the, fully cooling, further cooling the system uh, down. Yeah. Right. Of course, the reaching temperatures which are reachable in solids uh, seems to be out of reach, but certainly uh, to go into the regime of uh, some ordered phases uh, will be, I think, possible. And also larger systems is certainly on the way, and spin resolution and those things, they're all, all on the way. I think there is a lot of uh, development uh, in various groups worldwide uh, in these directions. Okay. I see Andrea Bianchi has a question. Andrea, could you ask your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, why... Why are the temperatures too high? I mean, people see uh, like in these uh, mixed fermion uh, boson gases, they see like superconductivity and and um, uh, uh, right. No, no, it depends on what you're looking at, right? So I mean, uh, so here really what 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 we're looking at is uh, a lattice system of of a Fermi, Fermi Hubbard type, and in that system, it's very hard to get below the the, the super exchange energy scale. This is a bit different when you're looking at, uh, for instance, I mean, a, a Bose Einstein condensate or something with bosons, yeah. it's much easier than fermions on the one hand, where you get a superfluid. And you can also get a superfluid of fermions in a continuum because there are some other tricks that, uh, oh, this is even more. or at least signatures of uh, formed pairs and, and stuff like this, this you can see. But on the lattice, it's a whole, a whole other scale because you have this super exchange. And this is, oh. this is what's making people trouble. So basically it's the lattice which heats things up or I mean, well, heats things up or the lattice the super exchange introduces a new low temp low energy scale which we have to overcome in some sense okay. which is not present in the continuum right okay and um and and this this is the big big challenge okay thank you but yeah mm -hmm. um so there was one question there yeah. andre maria has a question please go ahead uh, Thank you very much. It was very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. So, uh, are there any plans to go to a, a lower coupling? Because, uh, you know, as far as uh, deciding uh, th th theories, uh, there are some exact, uh, essentially exact results with uh, determinant uh, quantum Monte Carlo uh, for for you know small values of u. Right. So, I mean, our picture, of course, only holds in the extremely strong coupling limit right. because we have to have the separation of scales. Sure. And this is where we wanted to contribute somehow. I mean, the opposite limits are all very, very interesting, but all what I have said does not apply uh, in that regime, right? Because sure. we don't have, we can't apply the one Oppenheimer approximation for the charge on and the spin on. And whatever state there is, I mean, uh, it is, it should, one shouldn't, I think one shouldn't think about it in that way. As I have presented today. Yes, uh, yeah, certainly you're right. But uh, uh, my question is more towards the the experimentalists. Do they want to go in that direction, or or not? You know, or well, okay. I mean, I think mainly people uh, were interested so far uh, in the regime of um, well, setting the U somewhere close to what is what what seems to be relevant for group rates. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean. Changing the interaction string hue is particularly simple for these 
ultra cold atom settings, which are realized, for instance, in Marcus's group or in Emanuel's group here in Munich, because they have a flashback resonance on the lithium atoms and they can tune this basically at will from zero to very large values. So, uh, so this is certainly more like a question of uh, what, what, what is on, on, on the agenda. So technically, it is, would be easy to go to the weak coupling limit. Yeah. So what kind of physics would you propose to look at in that regime? No, I mean, uh, yeah, perhaps it's not so, uh, indeed, uh, it's uh, less relevant, but in the, for example, in the electron dope uh, cube rates, you get these uh, hot spots on the Fermi surface. And um, the other thing is that uh, to, to look at the cube rates, you need to add the second neighbor. Right, right. At least. So has this been We done have particle or? hole symmetry. Yeah. Pardon me? We have particle hole symmetry in all these uh, uh, situations. Yeah. Right. So it would be nice if you see how, how, how well this picture, this nice picture holds when you you add this uh, second neighbor hopping. I mean, it's true that you are adding another energy scale and making your life harder, but <laughs> that's... Uh, <clears throat> and technically, it's very simple, you know, because uh, here it's really tunneling through a quantum mechanical barrier, which sets the hopping, and uh, and uh, and uh, ah, you, ah, you mean okay, okay, weaker ah, you would you would go to weaker potential, so the diagonal tunneling is is allowed or something like this, right? I don't know. I mean, there's also perhaps some tricks with lasers. I have no idea how this. But what you want to have is kind of the diagonal. Yeah, this is, I mean, I want to see. Yeah, you want to have the diagonal and it changes the physics a bit in the sense because then mm -hmm. no, absolutely. Along the diagonal is, uh, is easier, right? For the, 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 these excitations because the spins are, are parallel. You're not, the stream would be mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's certainly a bit different physics. And I'm not quite sure whether you can uh, realize that easily because you know, the, the idea, um, is that you have a, a cosine standing wave a potential in two directions, which forms you this egg box uh, shaped potentials. And for that, ga getting a tunable and appreciably high uh, diagonal hopping is, is very hard, I think. Okay. Uh, maybe there are some, some tricks uh, which one could think about. But, but here, I mean, we go more into the direction of Occam's razor and say, the Hubbard model, I mean, is the minimal thing which captures, captures some of the essential physics. And I think various aspects of it are not yet understood. And once we understand that, we can map it back to the Kubrick problem and, right. uh, and, 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 and uh, see what the differences are, which sure, certainly yeah. are yeah. very important. No, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so I guess let's thank, uh, I think there are, we, we should we should now uh, adjourn. Uh, so let's thank Michael again uh, for his very nice uh, presentation. Um, thanks, Michael, and bye-bye. See you later. Right. Bye.